This week on Brian Ross Investigates, vigilante justice or injustice? A question raised by the trials of Kyle Rittenhouse and the three men accused of killing Ahmaud Arbery. And now this young woman accused of chasing down and killing a hit and run driver from a minor traffic accident. Ma'am! Yes. Ma'am! Did you pull the trigger of my gun in my hand? Ma'am! I'm the police officer to follow him. Her lawyer claims she had the right to make a citizen's arrest. She sees herself as a good Samaritan trying to assist in the apprehension of a perpetrator from a hit and run. The family of the man killed says she is a murderer. This is a person who wanted to be the law, who took things in her own manners and took a black life. And there are consequences for that. Now calls to strike the laws in every state that allow citizens arrests, a concept that dates back to medieval times. Now, ordinary citizens should not have the power to take the law into their own hands. Now, what we see far too often is uh, use of force and abuse of force. So you would recommend these laws essentially be abolished uh, across the country? Absolutely, yes. Uh, th their time has passed. Plus, this week's winners and losers in the media. See if you agree with the choices made by the editors of Mediaite. In 2021, the idea of making predictions for 2024 is folly. And by the way... With all due respect, that sounds like a cop-out. From the Law & Crime Trial Network, this is Brian Ross Investigates. Good evening, and thank you for joining us, and welcome to our friends on Facebook Live. I'm Brian Ross, joined, as always, by my colleague here at Law & Crime, Rhonda Schwartz. And Rhonda, we begin with the question of vigilante justice or injustice. A question raised by the trial of Kyle Rittenhouse in Wisconsin and the three men in Georgia accused of killing a young jogger there. It's not well known, but almost every state in this country allows what are called citizens' arrests, empowering individuals to act as if they were the police, a concept that dates back to medieval times yet remains valid to this day, Rhonda. That's right, Brian, and it's being used as a defense in cases all around the country, including one that's unfolding now also in Georgia. A young woman chased after a man involved in a minor hit and accident, traffic accident, stopped him and shot him dead. And now this case is raising great scrutiny as a test of the citizens' arrest laws. Hannah Payne, 21 years old, accused of exacting vigilante justice, murdering a 62-year-old man named Kenneth Herring. After she saw him driving away from the scene of a traffic wreck in Clayton County on May 7th, Payne's voice heard on a 911 recording, according to a detective, screaming at Kenneth Herring just before police say she shot him. I know he was having a diabetic episode because he don't just run off the scene. I knew he was trying to get to the hospital. I was still trying to figure out why she was trying to actually follow him all the way, block him in, and kill him. Officers say Payne saw Herring take off from the crime scene, so she followed him in her vehicle. He's trying to intercede since the subject left the scene. She cut in front of his vehicle, forcing him to stop. An altercation then ensued between the two of them, and during the altercation, Mr. Herring was shot and killed. She's using deadly force, Judge. She wasn't faced with deadly force. He has nothing, and then she shoots him. And we're joined now by the lawyer for Anna Payne, Matt Tucker. Mr. Tucker, thank you for being here. Would you call this vigilante justice or vigilante injustice? I would say vigilante injustice, more because she was a young girl. She was following the directives of the Department of Correction officer on the scene. She was following the directive of 911. She does have members of her family that are close to law enforcement. But they and did tell did her, don't follow. They did tell her, don't follow. They said it's our policy not to follow, but go get the tag. Can you get the tag? Go get the tag. Okay, now we actually do not want you to chase him. We just want you to be safe. What kind of vehicle is it? Is that the red Dakota? Get out the road, sir. Get out the road. Hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. What's the tag number? Red Dakota, front end damage. So she followed the directives from that. Um, after getting the tag, that's when they stated, all right, you need to come back to the scene of the accident. And she's like, ma'am, we he's already caused one. She said, you both need to come back to the scene of the accident. And that's when she stopped him. That's when she made sure that he wasn't going to cause another accident. And you're now set to go to trial sometime next year? I believe it's going to be in January. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and file a motion, an immunity motion, stating that she had the authority to do what she did. 
Um, it's still it's still a question of fact, and we are going to hope that the jury's going to find it in our favor, that she never pulled the trigger with intent to shoot him. They were fighting over the gun. His hands were on top of the gun, twisting it back towards her, and the gun went off. She immediately picked up the phone and said, oh my God, he just shot himself with my pistol. Does she see herself as a vigilante? She sees herself as a good Samaritan trying to assist in the apprehension of a perpetrator from a hit and run. Of course, she was not the police. Does she tell you that she regrets following Mr. Herring? She says she has nightmares about that the whole, the whole time. Her life has changed. But does she regret following him, trying to essentially conduct a citizen's arrest? It's hard to say regret because she was doing the right thing. In her mind, she was doing the right thing. She felt she was doing the right thing, and she was helping the police. Um, she regrets that day ever happened, and then she was there when the accident occurred. But to regret doing something she thought was helping the community, I, I don't. That would be a question for her, but from the indications I get, she felt she was doing the right thing, and that had it not escalated to what it was based on his actions, she would have been able to get him to go back to the scene and help and help the uh, community have an individual be accountable for his actions. Matt Tucker, thank you so much for joining us. We'll hear more from you when you go to trial next year. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. I appreciate you giving us the opportunity to allow Hannah to tell her side of the story. Hannah Payne has pleaded not guilty to the charges against her. And for now, as Tucker said, the trial is set to begin in January. She's currently free on $100,000 bail. And the fact that she is free has outraged the family of Kenneth Herring, who say she is not the good Samaritan she claims to be. And we're joined now by Sir Major, a spokesman for the family of Kenneth Herring. Mr. Major, thank you for being with us tonight. The lawyers for Hannah Payne say that she acted in, uh, as a citizen, making a citizen's arrest. What do you say to that? Um, I call that garbage. Uh, Ms. Hannah Payne acted as a, uh, a villain that day. She acted as a, uh, the female version of George Zimmerman, if you ask me. Uh, she had no legal authority. In fact, law enforcement and radio dispatchers told Ms. Payne not to chase or pursue and not to engage the hearing. She chose to do what she wanted to do, fatally taking his life. Uh, this all could have been avoided. Uh, Mr. Herring was having a medical emergency, which is why he disobeyed traffic laws. Uh, he was incapacitated. And Ms. Payne took this as, uh, you know, that she wanted to stop this guy and she wanted to serve her own form of justice. And she took his life. She says when she stopped Mr. Herring and approached him, he tried to grab the gun. And that's why the gun went off and he was shot. Well, certainly uh, we do know that uh, she did stick a gun in his face. She did assault him. Uh, and, and uh, physically assault him. Uh, and if I'm incapacitated next thing you know, I wake up and I see a gun in my face, uh, there may be a struggle as well. Uh, this is a natural reaction for anyone who sees a gun in their face, uh, is to defend themselves and to get that person away or off of them. Um, Ms. Hannah Payne was wearing a jacket that uh, was highlighted in the case that said badass. We know for a fact that Ms. Payne just recently got her gun license and we know, because when I got my gun license, I was ready to go to the to gun range. I was ready to pull the trigger to practice. And um, I think that Ms. Payne was just eager to pull that trigger. And when she says that she thinks of herself as a good Samaritan, what do you make of that? Well, there are a lot of good Samaritans that sitting in prison, right? So uh, this is a person who disobeyed the law. This is a person who wanted to be the law who took things in her own manners and took a black life. And there are consequences for that. And do you think it was a racially tinged uh, incident? Absolutely. I believe that if this had been a white driver, I don't believe that she would have pursued him in the beginning. I believe had it been a white driver, um, uh, maybe this story wouldn't be what it is today. She says she has no regrets, according to her lawyer, about what happened. She regrets what happened in the end, but no regrets in chasing down Mr. Herring. So what she just uh, inadvertently told the court and told the American people is that this will happen again and that America cannot stand by to watch. And for the family, what would be total justice? 
total justice would be uh, Miss Miss Hannah Payne being fully prosecuted uh, with with no leniency. Uh, we can't bring back Kenneth here. Uh, and the other thing is that we want uh, his family to be made whole again, whatever that looks like. All right. Well, sir, Major, thank you so much for joining us, uh, spokesman for the family of Kenneth Hare. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Coming up next, what you may not know about who can make a citizen's arrest in this country and the laws that make it possible. You're watching Brian Ross Investigates on the Law and Crime Trial Network. It was the video that shocked the nation. An unarmed black jogger, 25-year-old Ahmad Aubrey, gunned down in broad daylight. The three men charged will now stand trial. For live gavel to gavel coverage of the trial, subscribe to Law and Crime on YouTube TV today. And we're joined now by Professor Ivor Robbins, a professor of law at the American University School of Law who specializes and has written a lot about vigilante justice or what he calls vigilante injustice. Professor, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me, Brian. This notion that there are citizens arrest and that is legally possible throughout the country, this is a concept that began in medieval times, yet it continues? It began in medieval times. Uh, basically, it was a directive of the king uh, because there was no organized police force. Uh, when the king put out an order to the constables, the constables would call the citizenry to say, it is your duty to arrest a particular individual, or if the individual uh, was moving from county to county, it was the citizen's responsibility to follow the individual until that individual could be delivered to the sheriff. And yet that concept endures in this country in the 21st century? Not only does it endure, but every state in the United States has citizens arrest, uh, whether by a judicial decree uh, or by statute. Uh, every jurisdiction has it. Uh, they don't often use it. Uh, but from time to time, as we see in a couple of cases in Georgia, uh, it, it makes the headlines and in very important ways. We're seeing a spate of so-called uh, vigilante justice, or as you have called it, a vigilante injustice. Uh, do these laws need to be abolished or changed? In most instances, I would think they need to be severe, severely curtailed. Uh, ordinary citizens should not have the power to take the law into their own hands. Uh, what we see far too often is uh, use of force and abuse of force. Uh, are there situations in which citizen's arrest makes some sense? Uh, yes, if a police officer uh, a trained police officer is outside of his or her jurisdiction in some other jurisdiction and witnesses a crime. It makes sense for that individual to effect a citizen's arrest or a shopkeeper suspecting someone of shoplifting. Uh, it makes sense if the person has been trained to effect a citizen's arrest but not use force. Uh, but beyond that, it seems to me uh, these laws ought to be abolished. This, this is uh, a, a doctrine whose time should have passed, uh, not just years ago, but probably centuries ago. And yet we see it uh, used by all sorts of groups uh, across the country, from uh, so-called neighborhood patrols to efforts to arrest uh, public officials. We do see it, and, and that's where we also see abuses. Uh, it makes no sense for an ordinary individual to go up to someone whom he or she suspects of having committed a crime uh, and say, uh, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to shoot you. I'm going to arrest you. Uh, bad things can happen, uh, both to the individual who is arrested and to the arrestor. Uh, and when I say bad things can happen, I mean serious injury uh, or death. Uh, and if we're not talking at that level of seriousness, the person can be charged with a crime or can be sued in civil court for monetary damages uh, for, for false arrest. And so, for instance, the uh, plot to uh, arrest the governor of Michigan, other efforts. There was an attack on a, on a law professor, all because of disagreements over what was being taught. Uh, what are the most uh, sort of telling examples in your mind of, of the abuse of this citizen's arrest doctrine? Well, the, the most telling examples are the cases in Georgia. Uh, but you mentioned the uh, citizen's arrest of a professor in Virginia. That happened in 2014. And that's what got me interested in this issue. I thought, uh, if a person can come off the street, go into a, a classroom where a class is being taught, 
uh, go up to the professor uh, and say, uh, you're under arrest, I'm, I'm executing a citizen's arrest, and if you don't comply, I'm going to spray you with pepper spray, and that's exactly what happened. That makes no sense. People should not be taking the law into their own hands. So you see in the Hannah Payne case in Georgia, where she uh, effected a citizen's arrest on someone who had committed a hit and run uh, while driving, uh, she thought that she was allowed to do it. She went up to him and she said, I'm going to shoot you. And she shot him in the chest and killed him. Uh, was that a lawful citizen's arrest? No, uh, because uh, she thought that she was getting someone or arresting someone who had committed a felony, which is allowed under the old Georgia statute that was in effect at the time. It has since been changed. Uh, but in fact, uh, and again, I guarantee she would not have known this, uh, a hit and run in which there were no injuries in Georgia uh, is a misdemeanor. It's not a felony. So it was not a good citizen's arrest. But there are notions of the citizen's arrest doctrine around the country, and people try to invoke it as their defense when they get caught doing something. Uh, they do, and it should not be a good defense. Uh, and and, and it, in fact, it turns into a house of cards because the starting point is they say, uh, I, I had the right to commit a citizen's arrest. And then during the arrest, the person I was arresting attacked me. So I used self defense and I killed that individual. Uh, it's a house of cards because if the citizen's arrest was invalid, then the arrestor is an aggressor, and the aggressor does not have the right to self-defense. So you would recommend these laws essentially be abolished uh, across the country? Absolutely, yes. Uh, the, their time has passed. All right. Professor Ira Robbins from American University, thank you so much for being with us here tonight. Thank you very much for having me. Coming up next, this week's winners and losers in the media. See if you agree with the editors of Mediaite and what they had to say about CNN bombshell report on the tensions between President Biden and Vice President Harris. You're watching Brian Ross Investigates on the Law and Crime Trial Network. Time now for this week's winners and losers in the media, as chosen by the editors of Mediaite. And we're joined by Aidan McLaughlin, who's the editor-in-chief of Mediaite, which, like the Law and Crime Trial Network, is part of the Dan Abrams media empire. And Aidan, you've chosen as the winner for tonight CNN for its bombshell report on the relationship between Vice President Harris and President Biden. They call it a rocky relationship that she has with the White House, and they also cite dysfunction in her office. That's true. So there's a new report that dropped on Monday. I'm sure uh, your viewers have seen this. And it, it basically it's a sort of sprawling CNN report that uh, describes Kamala Harris as being sidelined in the White House and not having been adequately prepared for the job that she is carrying out. Um, the report is based on interviews with nearly three dozen former and current Harris aides, administration officials, outside Democratic office, uh, operatives, and outside advisors. And it painted a picture of a vice president who's struggling to make strides um, as her approval rating, uh, along with Joe Biden, dipped. Um, the report uh, was uh, conducted by uh, Ed Edward Isaac Dovier and Jasmine Wright at CNN, who are two really brilliant reporters. Uh, and it prompted some pushback from White House Press Secretary uh, Jen Psaki, as well as a number of other outside advisors to the White House who say there's really nothing here. There is no controversy. Um, but I think Suffice to say that this is based on enough internal sources within the White House and outside um, that I think we can we can uh, say that it's pretty legitimate. Um, it's a really good report, and it's making waves um, inside and outside the White House. Um, so those two reporters and CNN in general, uh, we decided to make winner this week. And from what you've seen, the story stands up. Yeah, I mean, the White House hasn't pointed anything specific in it that would be wrong. Um, I think it's pretty typical uh, for the White House to push back on this kind of story, which says, uh, that there's dysfunction and that there's uh, problems between the president's team and the vice president's team. Uh, so it's pretty predictable for the White House to push back on it. Um, but they haven't provided any evidence that anything in the story is false, um, aside from just casting it uh, as, you know, an attack on the vice president, um, either calling it uh, or suggesting that it's perhaps sexist or racist to be focusing on her. Um, of course, that's a little bit silly, and there's no evidence that this CNN report has anything to do with the vice president's race or gender. Right. And for a loser this week, you've chosen Chris Christie, the former New Jersey governor, for his prickly relationship with Dana Bash of CNN when she tried to ask him about why he was supporting Donald Trump. 
Donald Trump has made it pretty clear he wants to run for president again. Would you support him? Oh, look, I don't know that he's going to run. I don't what know if he does? I'm going to run. No. Look, what if? I, I've learned. I mean, it's not as if it's a big secret that he's seriously considering it. He's seriously considering it. Let's see what happens when he does. And let's see who he is and what he says and how he conducts himself. After everything you've described that he has done, you and, still. And that, and that, what, I'm say, no, look, what I'm saying to you is that I'm not going to sit here in 2021 and prejudge all this. In 2021, the idea of making predictions for 2024 is folly. And by the way. With all due respect, that sounds like a cop out. A cop out, Aiden. That's right. So Chris Christie has always walked this very strange tightrope. He's really close with President Donald Trump, uh, the former president. He was on his campaign. He was tapped uh, by Donald Trump to be his chief of staff. Ultimately, that fell through, uh, reportedly due to tensions between Chris Christie and Jared Kushner. Uh, Chris Christie voted for Trump twice, once in 2016, again in 2020. Um, but he's also criticized Trump publicly uh, and pretty relentlessly over the years. And in the new book uh, for which this interview uh, was being held uh, that Chris Christie put out about how to save the Republican Party, uh, Chris Christie is pretty harsh on Trump. He says that uh, when uh, Chris Christie uh, got COVID uh, and was hospitalized for seven days with COVID, uh, it was after debate prep that he had held with Donald Trump. Donald Trump also got COVID shortly after that debate prep. And he said that when Trump called him in the hospital, uh, he didn't really care about how Chris Christie was doing. He cared more about whether Chris Christie would blame him for getting COVID. Um, so he's walking this strange tightrope where he criticizes Donald Trump, but then still says that he might vote for him in 2024, which is sort of an odd position to be in, uh, and one that he's getting a decent amount of criticism for. It's the kind of position that all Republicans are going to have to do a dance about, right? Right. It's, and it's this bizarre tightrope. You know, do you criticize Trump for the January 6th insurrection, but also say that you might vote for him in 2024 so as not to alienate his base? Yeah. Um, it puts him in a very odd position, and Chris Christie hasn't done a great job of balancing that. All right, Aiden, thank you so much. That's our program for tonight. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you again here next week.